In this video, we're going to see how we can use both our angular equations of motion and our angular equivalent of Newton's law in order to find out parameters for a given system. So what we have on the screen here in the top left hand corner is a simple system where we have a chain around two sprockets. And sprockets are just like gears with gear teeth. So we have a driver sprocket on the left and we have a driven sprocket on the right meaning that the power is being inputted at the driver sprocket and it's being used to drive the driven sprocket. Now all of the calculations that we're going to do in this video are going to be for the larger sprocket or the driven sprocket. And we've been given various bits of data. So first of all we've been given the force in the chain or the tensile force in the chain and that's going to result in a pulling force on the outside of the driven sprocket. We've then got the radius and the mass of the sprocket as well as the initial velocity of 85 rpm. Now we've been given a time there, t, and that's going to be the time that the sprocket's accelerating for. So in a moment we'll see that sprocket's going to be accelerating under the force f, and that acceleration is going to take place for a time t. Now the things that the question's asking us to find is, first of all it wants us to find omega, which is the final velocity. Okay, so we're saying that before the acceleration takes place, the sprocket's travelling at 85 rpm, and we want to know how fast it's travelling after it's accelerated for 1.5 seconds. We then want to know the maximum kinetic energy that the sprocket has. And kinetic energy is just the energy that something has when it's in motion. So if this driven sprocket is rotating, it's going to have kinetic energy as a result. And finally, we're going to find the centrifugal acceleration. And the centrifugal acceleration is the acceleration that acts away from the centre of something when it's rotating. The best visualisation I can give for this is when you're on a roundabout and that roundabout's being spun very quickly, it almost feels as though you're being pulled out from the centre of the circle. And that's because of the centrifugal force. And along with centrifugal force, you have centrifugal acceleration, or the acceleration of an object away from the centre of the rotating circle. In this instance, with the chain and sprocket, the centrifugal force would determine the tension that we needed on that chain to make sure it didn't come off of the sprocket. So from the question, we know that this sprocket's going to be accelerating. So what we need to find, before we can do any calculations involving velocities, is we're going to need to find the acceleration. Now there's a number of different formulas which contain acceleration as a variable. The first one is the angular equivalent of Newton's second law, which states that T equals I alpha. So if we know the torque, and if we know the moment of inertia, we can use that equation to calculate alpha. An alternative equation is one of our equations of motion, which states that alpha equals omega minus omega zero over t. If, for example, we know the starting and final velocity, and we know the time taken for the acceleration to occur, we can work out alpha using that equation. Now in this case, we don't know omega and we don't know alpha, so we can't use that equation. We have no way of finding omega and alpha without using the equation on the left, which states that t equals i alpha. So let's rearrange that to make alpha the subject. Alpha equals t over i. Torque over moment of inertia. So what do we know about this system? Well, we know the force here, f, because that's going to be the tensile force in our chain, and it's given as 12.5 newtons. And we also know the distance of that force from the pivot in the centre. The distance of that force from the pivot in the centre is the radius r, which we also know. So we can calculate the torque, because torque equals force times distance. And we can also calculate the moment of inertia, because we know the mass of our sprocket, and we know the radius of our sprocket. So we'll calculate those two variables first. We'll calculate t, which is force times distance, or in this case, force times radius. Our force is 12.5 newtons, and our radius, we need to take care here, our radius is 120 millimetres, divided by 1,000 to get that into SI units is 0.12 metres. Therefore, the torque being applied to that sprocket in order to cause this acceleration is 1.5 and the units are newton meters. 
Next we need to calculate our moment of inertia. And if you recall from the previous video, moment of inertia is resistance to acceleration. So we know the torque, what we need to know is how resistant this gear is to acceleration, because then we can calculate the acceleration. Well, moment of inertia for a solid disc is a half m r squared. And for the purpose of this question, we're going to treat that sprocket as a solid disc. Half times the mass of 19.5 times the radius squared. Now, once again, our radius in meters is 0.12. We square that and our moment of inertia becomes 0 0.1404. And our units are kilogram meter squared. The reason it's kilogram meter squared is because if we refer to our formula, a half mr squared, a half's just a constant, it doesn't carry any units. We have a mass in kilograms times a radius squared. Well, a radius is measured in meters, so radius squared is meter squared. Kilograms times meter squared gives us kilogram meter squared. So the next step is to calculate our acceleration. And we've already said that alpha is T over I. We know T is 1.5 and we know I is 0.1404, giving us an angular acceleration of 10.684 rads per second squared. We know that it's rads per second squared because we've been working in SI units throughout. So now we can complete part A of this question because we can use our second formula for alpha, which states that alpha equals omega minus omega zero over t. We want omega on its own. So first of all, we're going to times by t, giving alpha t equals omega minus omega zero. And finally, because we want omega on its own, we need to add omega zero to each side. So omega equals alpha t plus omega zero. So now let's plug in our values and find our final velocity after the acceleration has taken place. And just a reminder, the thing that's causing this acceleration is the force F or the tension in the chain. So we have alpha. We've just calculated that. It's 10.684 radians per second squared. The time for the acceleration, it's given in the question, 1.5. And our initial velocity is 85 RPM. Well, we know that we need to convert that to SI units. 85 RPM. To get that into radians per second, we've already said our conversion is 2 pi over 60. Therefore, omega in radians per second is 8.90 rads per second. So it's that value in rads per second that goes into our equation, 8.90. And our final angular velocity is 24.93 rads per second. Now, if you wanted to express that in RPM, you could. All you would do is invert your conversion, so it would become times 60 over 2 pi, and you'd multiply your angular velocity down here in rads per second by 60 over 2 pi. Now, if you do that in this instance, you get an angular velocity of 238 RPM. And that is to the nearest whole number. So the sprocket has accelerated from 85 RPM, which was given in the question, to 238 RPM, so roughly three times the velocity, in a time of 1.5 seconds under a force of 12.5 newtons. And as we said in the previous video, the mass and the radius of the sprocket would affect that calculation because the mass and the radius affect the resistance to acceleration. So I'm just going to add that value in radians per second to our list of variables. So part A, find omega. We've just said that omega equals 24.93 rads per second. And now we can clear some space for part B and part C.
So part B asks us to find how much kinetic energy the driven sprocket has once the acceleration has been complete. The faster the sprocket goes, the more kinetic energy it has. And our equation for that, for rotational motion, is EK equals a half I omega squared. We're going to look in more detail at different types of energy and how they're calculated in a different topic. But one of the purposes of a component called a flywheel is to store rotational energy. So whilst we're discussing rotational motion, it makes sense to look at how we would calculate the energy stored in this rotating sprocket. So our kinetic energy then, and note the question asks for the maximum kinetic energy. Well, the kinetic energy is going to be maximum when the velocity is maximum, because everything else remains the same. We've got a half times I. Well, we calculated I for this sprocket previously, and it was 0 0.1404 kilogram meter squared and omega in SI units we've just calculated 24.93 and we need to square that angular velocity. So running that through the calculator gives us a kinetic energy of 43.6 joules. So that's how much energy is stored in that rotating object once it's reached its final velocity. Now the final question, part C, asks us to calculate the centrifugal acceleration. And let's just start with a small sketch. Now I mentioned earlier, if you was on a roundabout that was spinning quickly, you would experience a force trying to pull you away from the centre. Now that force gives rise to the acceleration. That force is called the centrifugal force, and it gives rise to centrifugal acceleration. If the centrifugal force was too large, then that may cause our chain to come off the sprocket. What we need to do is make sure there's sufficient tension in the chain to prevent that from happening. So in this example, we're just going to calculate the centrifugal acceleration just so that we can demonstrate how we apply the formula. And the formula for centrifugal acceleration, A subscript C, is just omega squared times R. So because we're calculating the centrifugal acceleration at the larger speed, we're going to use the larger speed. We've got 24.93 squared times our radius, but we need to use our radius in metres, which is 0 0.12. Therefore, that gives rise to a centrifugal acceleration of 74.6. And our units for that are metres per second squared. Now the reason it's metres per second squared is because it's a linear acceleration. We drew it on our diagram here. It's a linear acceleration because it acts from the centre of our rotating object outwards. So just in closing to this video, all of the equations that I've used, plus all of the others that you need to complete the practice questions, are included on the equations and information sheet at the top of this topic. So please download a copy or even print it as a reference tool to help you with the practice questions.